Families for Life, a podcast of Oak Hill Baptist Church. On today's episode, we're talking about Christians calling to hard work. Welcome back, everyone. Welcome back, listeners. I'm excited that you're here to listen to the podcast today. I want to remind you to subscribe to the podcast, give us a review, share your uh, thoughts, any reactions, any things you want us to talk about on the podcast. Email your feedback to f4l at oakhillbc.org. This week is another solo episode. I know you so enjoy those. You love hearing me. But I tell you this morning, I'm excited. I'm caffeinated. I have my cold brew coffee here, and I am ready to go. Uh, next week, we're hoping to have a special guest. And next week, we're going to talk about, we're going to do a fun episode, I believe. We've done some heavy topics and some things that are trying to stretch us and encourage us in our faith. And I think from time to time, it's good to do something that is just a little bit fun, a little bit lighthearted, and so that's what we're hoping to do next week. But today uh, will not be lighthearted. Today will hopefully be very challenging. I have been <clears throat> very challenged in my own faith recently, and uh, we sh- I shared some of these thoughts and feelings with Pastor Brian Van Doren on that episode when he came on, and I just wanted to talk about that a little bit more uh, in light of a book that I've been reading, actually listening to, sometimes I find it's easier to listen to audio books as I'm, you know, doing mowing the lawn or doing other chores. I can get through a book a lot faster than finding time to sit down and read it, especially one that uh, <clears throat> I'm not studying, but you know, it's it's more of a narrative. So I I just finished One Man's Wilderness by Sam Keith. This is the account of Dick Pernecki, or Richard, and how he journeyed to Alaska at around 50 years old. He had worked, and he was a single guy, and had decided that he'd had enough of civilization, of modern life. Uh, And this is back years ago. You know, we're talking, uh, gosh, we're talking in the 60s, I believe, uh, he was tired of modern life. I, I imagine, I wonder what he would think about today's modern life. But anyway, he traveled to Alaska, one of the remotest parts of Alaska, the Twin Lakes area, only accessible really by plane. You know, they had seaplanes that would come in and land on the lake. And there were, in this area, there were like hunters that would come in, hunting lot. There was a hunting lodge nearby. Uh, there were other people that had cabins, but not people that stayed year round. And it wasn't, it wasn't like people were living there because this is a very harsh country. And so he traveled there, and there was a, a friend of his in the book known as Spike, and he stayed at Spike's cabin. And all the while, he this this he's journaling and recording video and taking pictures this whole time. So he was into. Um, you know, he would have maybe been very much into the TikTok age because he's putting everything out there. No, he wasn't online. There was no online at the time. But he did meticulously record everything. That's why we have such great accounts. But the whole point was he was going out there to build his own log cabin, to set up his own li- new kind of life out there, to live by his hand. There's no power tools because there's no power out there. Everything he built was by hand. So he was able to, uh, in a matter of months, uh, build a log cabin, actually a really great log cabin that people have marveled at how he was able to build this by his hands, his own hands, built it all with hand tools. And what he says in the book is he, he, he had, at 50 years old, he wanted to go out and see kind of what he was made of. He wanted to test himself. He wanted to do something that was difficult, to go out and live on the land to see if he could do it. And so he stayed in this cabin. Uh, he built this cabin, stayed in there for 16 months in this area until he's, his own father had some health uh, issues. And so he had to, he flew back, he was flowed back to the lower 48 and ended up spending the winter uh, back in the States in the lower 48. But but for the most part, for the better part of 30 years until into his 80s, he stayed at the cabin 
many years year round. Uh, sometimes he would come uh, back for the winter. The winters would be uh, very harsh. They would um, get down to negative 40 below. And uh, as he accounts in this book, I, I love it. I don't know if, if many people would enjoy this book because it, it is an account of today. Uh, you know, it's, it's a, a lot of reading of journal accounts. So he would be like, today I laid the foundation for my cabin, you know, with beach gravel and these logs. And, you know, so there's some of that. But interspersed in there, he takes time to really detail the wildlife and uh, his journeys around the the lake and you know, taking his, uh, the canoe out and, uh, his interactions with wildlife. He was in the book, he was attacked by a bear uh, twice and survived. Um, <clears throat> he had, um, just so many great accounts in this book. And I really loved it because throughout the book, uh, he would also give little advice, you know, things like, um, you know, for instance, like a man's got a, a man feels good after working with his hands or diff different kind of just little little sayings or idioms that he would say, especially about about being a man and things you would, you know, as a man, you need to, to test yourself and to do. And so I really found myself enjoying this book a lot and really kind of getting in. I watched some of his videos online that he that he about him building his cabin and doing different things like that. You can find a lot of these resources on YouTube and pictures online. He's passed. He's passed away. Uh, I believe it was two thousand and three, maybe something like that. And uh, he willed his cabin to the National Park Society. And actually, now at, at um, Twin Lakes, they have a ranger station there. They said, and so this is an area where people do go, and it is more more touristy, but it's still very wilderness. There's still hunters that go and hunt the wild rams. And things like that, but boy, it just it just really got me thinking about you know this guy uh, of his own volition decided to do a one of the most difficult things that a person could do: go live on the land, start from scratch, build his home. Uh, you know, he had one thing about a man, you know, about about having to heat your 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 cabin. You know, and he said a man feels good working for his heat. And I thought I resonated with that as I've cut wood and done things like that in the past. And so I just really um, admired him and, and looked at this book. And as I was thinking about all of the spiritual things that God has been doing in my life and thinking about the things that I've been being pushed to do and then reading this book sort of just by accident, stumbling across this book and listening to it, you know, it really made me think about the easy life and then some of the some of the difficult things that we choose to avoid you know we we want to make life easy most of our modern life most of the things that we want in life are there to quote make life easier we move forward in technology we move forward in things because we want things to be to be easy to be uh to be good you know um recently in one of the mandalorian episodes they had a, a what was thought to be a utopian society where these people didn't have to work. They had robots and machines do everything so they could just live a life of leisure. And I think many people would um, would like that, would want that, would say, man, I just want to sit around all day and binge watch shows and do what I want to do and not have to be told to go to work and not have to earn a paycheck. Wow, wouldn't that just be the greatest utopian society ever? And I really wonder if we would find true satisfaction in that because I, I don't know, I don't really find a lot of satisfaction in doing easy things. I find satisfaction in accomplishing things and doing hard things. And when, um, when, you, when you really worked hard at something, you know, when I worked hard to earn my degrees or I've worked hard on a project at home or at church, I've accomplished something, you know, I've written uh, a sermon from scratch. I mean, that those those things give you such a sense of accomplishment and they're not easy. They're difficult. So my question is, when it comes to faith, should we try to walk the easy road in our faith? Should we should we always seek for the life of comfort, whether we want comfort in our life, whether we want to do hard things like Dick Pernecki and go out into the wilderness and 
and camp and, you know, forage and kill our own food and all that stuff. Let's put that aside. But I just want to ask the question, should we try to walk an easy road in the area of faith? What about if we have trials? What if we have to endure hard things, difficulties in life? You know, the Christian Christianity is is not a calling to an easy life. In any way, in many ways, it makes life more difficult. You know, we are called, think about this, we're called to put off the world, the evil of the world, the sinful pleasures of the world, and we're to we're supposed to be striving to live in a way that brings glory to God. This type of living does have a reward and blessing. We do have less hardship in the area of consequences from sin, but you can trade that for consequences from the world. You think about many of those that have been martyred for the faith, and they were persecuted, and they did not have an easy road. They had difficulties because they were trying to live a life that brought glory and honor to God rather than live a life of worldliness. And so there is that that trade-off. But as I thought about this, I picked out a few major themes that are hard work for Christians. And there are many things that we could talk about, but I picked a few things, and 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 there's scripture here that we're going to talk about. But there are many things that we should should run to. Um, These are things that we should desire to see in our lives. Yes, they are hard, but we should not be afraid of them. We should desire to test ourselves, not only to see what we can do, but to see a fulfilling life lived for the Lord. And so the first thing is is kind of this overall broad theme is just the hard work of discipleship. And I think this is probably the big major theme when we when we talk about Christianity. We're talking about the hard work of discipleship, or you could call it uh, sanctification, if you want a theological word. If you want to just simplify it, you could say becoming like Christ. This is hard work. There are many metaphors throughout Scripture. You know, it talks about being sharpened like iron, or being pl- being a plant that is pruned. That those thing, kind of things help us to understand the process of what God is wanting to do in our lives, and in this process. We find trials, but here's the thing. These trials will help to mold us like nothing else, like nothing else. Think about a a trial or a situation in your life. Think about the lessons that you've learned through that, uh, how you've grown as a person. There's nothing that helps to do that other than, than enduring trials, enduring those things and coming out the other side and learning and growing. James 1, 2 through 4 says, Count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds. For you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness, and let steadfastness have its full effect that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. If you look at this verse, he's telling us that we will face trials of various kinds. We will meet trials. And when we face trials, we will be made more mature in our faith. All of these things, this, this, these trials, this testing, you can look at it as a testing of your faith. And it's going to produce, after all, after, after you endure them and you see them as God wants you to see them and you operate in faith, then they're going to mature you. They're going to bring you to a place where you are made to be more like Christ. Think about all the trials that Jesus endured, all the things that he went through, not only the cross, but the things leading up to it and all the things that he faced. Uh, He's an example to us of how we need to walk through trials, how we need to trust God's plan. And when we do, we will be made like him. And so I think just the fact that we are in a process of discipleship, you know, here's the thing. I think many Christians don't even recognize this. They don't even understand that they're in a, they should be in a process of being discipled. And so this is where you can do self-discipling. You can find books or resources, or you can just get into the word and learn and grow. You can find someone else to help you walk that road as well. That's important. You can get in a group, a discipleship group or an accountability group with men, other men 
with men or ladies with other ladies. But I think everybody needs to walk and see their life as on this road of discipleship and growing. And and it's not that you're ever complete. You know, I've been a Christian for a couple couple decades now, uh, maybe a little longer. <laughs> but uh, as we look at my as I look at my life, I'm still growing. I'm still walking down this road. I'm still striving to be more like Christ. And so I think that's important. It, it is hard work, but boy, it's so rewarding. The reward is maturity in our faith. And it's not easy, but it's something we need to press into. One of the, the, the big parts of discipleship is the hard work of surrender. This is one of the hardest things for some people to do in the area of discipleship. It's to surrender. You know, we understand that before we grow in our faith, we must surrender in faith to the Lord. Many people, when they become a Christian, they say, okay, thank you, Lord, for my salvation. Now I'm going to live my life as a Christian in my own power. That just doesn't work. That's just not something you can do. Your your faith is the beginning point when you become a believer. That's the start. That's the jumping off point. But your faith continues to grow and we must surrender to the work of Christ and the Holy Spirit in our lives. It's a continual surrender, saying, God, I, I need to surrender my will. I need to surrender my ways to you. And when we do that, it's almost like it's hard work because we don't want to do it, but it's freeing when we say, okay, God, it's your way. It's your will. It's your word that I'm following. It's freeing because I don't have to live in some sort of system where I have to be good enough or I have to try hard enough. It's God working and growing in me. I love where James says in uh, verse in chapter 1, verse 12, Blessed is the man who remains steadfast under trial. For when he has stood the test, he will receive the crown of life, which God has promised those who love him. The only way to remain steadfast is to surrender to the Lord. That's it. We can't do this in our own strength. There's no way that we're going to receive the crown of life in and of ourselves. It's only through the power of the gospel and the Holy Spirit which sustains us in our lives. It also says in John 16, 33, Jesus said, I have said these things to you that in me you have peace. In the world you will have tribulation, but take heart. I have overcome the world. So the idea is we are surrendering to Christ. If we are in the world, it says you're going to have troubles. You're going to have trials. We should expect that. But Jesus has, through the power of the gospel, has overcome that in our lives. He's coming so that we can have peace in him. And the way to do that is through surrender. So I think this is something that's so missed in the believer's life. And I really want to push people and say, quit trying Quit trying to live your faith in your own power. Seek the Lord. Surrender to his work and will and way in your life, and you will see immense growth in your spiritual walk. The next thing is the hard work of self-reliance. Part of the Christian life is self-reliance. Now, I want to qualify this because as Pastor Brian Van Dorn and I have talked about in the past, we talk about a lot of things in, in balance, right? Right. So as I say that we need to be self-reliant, we can never be fully self-reliant. And we shouldn't seek to be totally self-reliant. We need others in the church for community. It is impossible to be totally self-reliant. Even Dick Pernecki couldn't be totally self-reliant in the Alaskan wilderness. He had a friend who would fly in on a plane and bring him supplies. He was able to order things from the Sears catalog, you know, he lamented the fact that when he put his roof on, he, he had a moss covered roof, but underneath the moss, he did put uh, tar paper or something, you know, roofing paper down to uh, make it really weather tight. And he lamented the fact that he had to use that, but that was going to be the best thing for his cabin. It's one of those things that, um, you know, he needed other people. He relied on other people in, in, in some ways, even though he was doing a lot of things in self-reliance. But, you know, in today's culture, the reason we're pushing back against um, 
a lot of reliance on other people. In today's culture, we are less reliant on ourselves, and we're so reliant on other people, not only for physical things, but for mental and spiritual and just just so many things in our spiritual life. We don't seek to learn and grow and know the word ourselves. We seek to be spoon-fed like babies, to, to, to have a pastor or a teacher or someone on Facebook or YouTube teach us these truths, give us these little verses, give us these little, these little uh, gifts or these little things that are going to supposedly fill us up spiritually even when they don't. And so we, we rely on others for our own spiritual walk. We rely on others for our emotional support. We don't, we don't work through many of our problems with the Lord in prayer, in faith. We, we run to others and we, we dump our spiritual or mental things on people. And again, I'm not saying it's not bad to, to work with people and talk to them and have them help you. That's not bad. But we've got to, um, the, 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 the total and utter self or the total and utter reliance on others is not good. It's not good. Now, self-reliance doesn't mean that you're not reliant on the Lord. That is a must for believers. And so I don't want you to think because we're talking about self-reliance that it's, it's in you. Remember, it's not in your power. It's in the power of the Lord. But what I'm talking about is when Paul talks in 1 Thessalonians, he's talking about there's a difference between the way a Christian uh, lives and the way somebody lives in the world. And so he says in verse 9, Now concerning brotherly love, you have no need for anyone to write to you, for you yourselves have been taught by God to love one another. So he's saying the, the church at Thessalonica, you are loving. And they talked about, um, he says, And for that indeed is what you were doing to all the brothers throughout Macedonia. We urge you, brothers, to do this more and more. So lean into love. Okay, here's here's what I want to point out. In verse 11, he says, And to aspire to live quietly, to mind your own affairs, to work with your hands as we instructed you, so that you may walk properly before outsiders and be dependent on no one. It's interesting that he would say that. He wants the community of believers to be reliant on themselves and even each other. The idea is they're not going to be reliant on the world. Rather, they're going to take care of business themselves. Now, that doesn't mean that they don't go out because what does he say? You're, you're, you're loving all the brothers throughout Macedonia, and, and this doesn't exclude spreading the gospel and serving others and loving others. We know that. But there is this idea that through it all, they're, they're taking care of one another. They're helping one another. They're relying on themselves. And I think that's important that we work within the church to help one another when a need arises. Well, this is going to be a testimony to the world. If we are helping one another, if we're not pushing off our fellow believers saying, oh, well, sorry, you got a problem, uh, you know, like, you know, hey, go figure it out. No, we say, hey, that your problem is is our problem, and we're going to help you. We're going to help you walk through that. And this idea of of hard work, of quiet living, of all of these things are principles that we need to take to heart, and they all speak to how we as believers need to live in front of the world. And I think if we would examine these a little closer, study them, and try to implement them in our lives— we would be much further down the road. We would care more about our relationship with the Lord and our relationship with the church than we would about how we appear in front of the world, how we appear as trying to be, uh, you know, people that are out there on social media or out there famous or whatever, whatever the trap of the world is. We can chase a rabbit hole here because I have lots of opinions and feelings on the celebrity Christian world that I'll share with you if you want sometime but it makes me sick. And so I think that this kind of verse, this kind of advice is going to draw us into a holy relationship, a closeness with the Lord like nothing else. So then we move on and we talk about the hard work of work. This is where the idea of a workless society falls short because God invented the idea of work. God has given Adam, I've talked about this before, I believe, but God had given Adam work to do in the garden. 
he had given him to the, the idea of tending the garden, of caring for the garden. Now, it wasn't as hard. It, he wasn't having to cultivate, you know, after the fall. It talks about how he would have to toil and labor uh, intensely by, by planting his food, by raising his livestock. But the idea in the garden is he tends the garden, he takes care of it, and he can go out, collect fruits and vegetables and all these things that are growing in the garden. He can, uh, he's told to name the animals. The animals are brought to him. I mean, this is, this is work. This is, this is things to occupy his time and bringing glory to the Lord through it. God wants us to work and he wants us to work hard for his glory. It says in Colossians three twenty three, whatever you do, work heartily as for the Lord and not for men. You know, when you go to work or you do work around the house or you take care of your family, whatever the work is, work doesn't have to be something you're paid for. It can be volunteer. It can be, um, it can be whatever, whatever you consider work. Uh, you're to do it as you're doing it for the Lord, even though you have an earthly boss, that is the secondary concern. The primary concern is, are you working in a, in a hard way to please the Lord? To please the Lord. You know, Proverbs 6, 3, 16, 3, commit your work to the Lord and your plans will be established. God is telling us he cares about how we work. He cares about what we do. And it, it is difficult. There is difficulties in work. There are hardships. There are trials. And what he is telling us is to endure those, to walk into those. That leads us to the next part, which is the hard work of suffering. We will face suffering. This is a fact. Jesus tells us, he already, we've already seen in one of the verses that we read, we will face tribulations. We will face suffering. But once again, we can see suffering can be a thing that matures us in our faith. Paul had something very similar. James talked about the trials that produce maturity. Paul said in Romans 5, 3 through 5, not only that, but we rejoice in our sufferings. Think about that. Just stop right there. We rejoice in our sufferings. Why? Because he says in the next in the next sentence here, knowing that suffering produces endurance, and endurance produces character, and character produces hope. And hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. Paul's saying that we are to rejoice in suffering because all of this suffering that we have to face as believers is going to help us to mature us. And ultimately it's going to give us hope. It's going to increase our faith in the Lord. We will not be put to shame because we will not walk away from the Lord. We will not leave him. We will continue to trust him. One of the things that we've done very poorly in raising this generation of believers in the last maybe couple of generations is told them that they're not to expect suffering or not to walk into suffering or be willing to suffer because that is not the Christian life because it's through suffering that our faith is grown. Our faith is, is increased. And so it's not a surprise to me that many believers walk away from the Lord because they haven't been given the faith that has been forged in the fire of trials and suffering. They don't know, they, 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 they're shanghai They come into the faith and they're told, oh, this life is going to make you so much better. This, 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 fa or this faith is going to make you so much better. It's going to make your life this and that. And I'm not opposed to telling people the benefits of faith. I have received immense benefits from the Lord and how he has walked with me and loves me and helps me. And I'm looking forward to the future glory and all of those things. But we also have to be realistic because didn't Jesus tell his disciples to count the cost? Didn't he say, Jesus didn't just say, oh, you're, you're going to receive all these benefits. You're going to live in heaven with me one day. He did say that, but that wasn't the only thing he said. He told his disciples to count the cost. And if you don't make me primary, if you don't make me Jesus primary in your life, then you're, you, this is not going to happen. It's not going to be worth it here. And so I think it's really important that we don't run away from suffering, but we run to suffering. This doesn't mean we cause intentional suffering in our lives, but we don't seek to avoid it. We seek to walk into it. You know, I think about the many 
missionaries that struck out on God's call. Man, they suffered greatly for the Lord, and they rejoiced in their suffering because they loved the Lord, and they toiled, and they labored. And you think about Adoniram Judson and, and Judson and all of these people that went off into these, these areas that had not been touched by the gospel. Even today, missionaries going out, putting their life on the line, going to areas that are dangerous, going to areas where they're unchurched, un, un, whatever, un, untelling of the gospel. They just haven't heard, and they have to strike out in unknown fear and unknown suffering. And so I commend all of them, and I think in our lives, maybe we're not called to be a missionary, but we should emulate their lives. We should emulate that there are things, there are things in life that we're going to have to suffer. We're going to have to stand up for our biblical beliefs. What kind of suffering will that bring us in this world with our job, with our friends, with people of our society that look at us and think we're crazy? that we lose respect with because we don't uh, believe how they think we should believe in the, the modern age of, of going against God's word. And so we're to expect this. We're to, we're to know that suffering is a reality, and we should walk into it rejoicing, as Paul says. This leads me to the hard work of holiness, I think one of the uh, the big things we got to get our head around is we are called to holiness. This means that we're willing to kill sin and stand up to temptation in our in our lives, and we're attempting to live, walk in the spirit. I think this is lost on many people today. I know it was lost on me for a long time. We are so defeated and captivated by sin that we don't even know where to start. It says in Romans 12, 1, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercy of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Our lives should be lived in a way that we are a sacrifice to the Lord, that we are an offering that is holy and acceptable to God. This is, this is what Paul says is an act of worship. The very way that we live our lives is a worship to the Lord. It's a song to him. And so we have to ask ourselves, how does our life look? Does it sound like one of the great hymns of the faith, one of the the great praise songs? Is it it calling out to God and praising him? Or is it a song that is steeped in our sinfulness? Is it a song that is steeped in rebellion away from God? And we have to ask ourselves, what kind of life are we living? Are we pursuing holiness? You know, when we surrender to the Lord, we talked about surrender, when we seek his help, there is the ability and the way to kill sin. Now, I don't, I'm not one of these people that believes you can be totally sinful and sin-free. The process of sanctification is this fight against the flesh, and that's going to endure our entire lives. But I do believe that as Christians, we can overcome sins in our lives, especially these nagging or besetting sins, these things that are intentional in our lives, these sins that we plan for, these sins that we desire and seek after in our lives. We can, we can kill those, and we should. And then we can find a way to overcome through the Lord, overcome temptation. Look at the verse in 1 Corinthians 10, 13. He says, no temptation is overtaking you that is not common to man. God is faithful, and he will not let you be tempted beyond your ability, but with the temptation, he will also provide the way of escape that you may be able to endure it. Wow, what encouragement there. I mean, how often have you just been tempted and you immediately fall to temptation? You immediately just, wow, I mean, you don't even put up a fight. That's because your faith has not been forged to understand this type of truth, that God is faithful, and we need to lean into his faithfulness so that he can build that own, the faithfulness in us. Remember, what are the fruits of the Spirit? Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness. 
gentleness, and self-control. God has given us these things. If we will lean into our relationship with him and our uh, our walk with him, these fruits will come out of our lives. And then we can look at temptation and we can turn away from it. We can turn away from sin. To do this, we've got to understand that we've got to find accountability in our lives. Our lives must be steeped in scripture. I want you to think about your life as a cup of, of water. What you put in that water is go, like a like a tea bag or something like that is going to it's going to take on the flavor. It's going to take on the properties of what is steeped in that water. And so if your life is a cup of water and you only steep worldliness and sin and those things, if you steep it in those that type of tea, it's going to taste like that. But if you take the scripture and your life is permeated, if you steep scripture into your life, then your whole life will be filled. Your mind, your body, your spirit will be filled with God's word. And in that way, we can put sin to death. We can fight back against temptation. We can pursue holiness. And listen, just because you failed in the past doesn't mean that you are defeated. Doesn't mean that you're defeated. Just because you've fallen, what does the scripture say? Proverbs 24, 16, a righteous man falls seven times and rises again. God gives us that ability through his spirit to rise again and again. And eventually, if we surrender ourselves, we commit ourselves, we do the hard work, we will have victory. One more thing here, or two more things, really, the, the hard work of evangelism. I think evangelism is is not easy. We're going to face lots of rejection when we share our faith. Uh, you know, one of the things I want to say about this is just we don't have to worry about the results. We need to focus on being faithful to share. And we need to just press into a missional lifestyle where we think of ourselves as missionaries. You know, we think of evangelism as a program or as a as something that's kind of an afterthought. But what if we looked at our lives and we said, I, I'm a missionary for the Lord. As I go to work, as I go to school, as I go all around my life, I'm a missionary. I'm a missionary for the Lord. If we would consider our lives like that, we would lean into it. Yes, it would be hard work. Yes, it would be a, 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 an ulterior primary focus, but it would help us to live our lives and bring glory to the Lord through evangelism, through reaching out with the gospel and sharing our faith. The last thing I wanted to mention was the hard work of perseverance. This is one of the biggest concepts that's helped me as I went through seminary. I had a, a class and it, part of the class they talked about perseverance and what it meant for us to persevere in the Christian life. You know, the Christian life is not a sprint. It's a marathon. We're not trying to train so that we can get from here to here, 40 yards, 100 yard dash. That's not it. The idea is we're, we're running our entire race through our lives, faithfully, steadily running for the Lord, continuing on. In fact, the, the, the Bible relates our Christian uh, life to a walk, even a continual, steady walk, continuing on, continuing to, to move forward not get sidetracked, not go to the left or the right. If we stumble, if we fall down, we get back up, we keep going. And, I, and there's a couple of verses here where it says, 1 Peter 4, 12 through 13, Beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery trial when it comes upon you to test you as though something strange were happening to you. But rejoice insofar as you share Christ's suffering, that you may also rejoice and be glad when his glory is revealed. We're continuing on. We're continuing in suffering. We're continuing in these trials that one day we will rejoice. We will be glad when God's glory is revealed to us. Won't that be a fantastic day? I also love this verse. Uh, we've mentioned this verse before in James, James 1, but I want to mention it again. Blessed is the man who remains steadfast under trial, for when he has stood the test of time, he will receive the crown of life, which God has promised to those who love him. God is telling us to persevere, to stay steadfast in under these trials, to rely on him. And when we do, we will receive the reward one day. We must persevere. It is hard work. 
We must persevere. You know, I could go on and on. I kept thinking of topics as I was preparing this. The hard work of walking in the Spirit. The hard work of forgiveness. All these things. You could continue on. There are many things that we must press into. The point is God is calling us to hard things. To know them. To work through them. We must read the Word. We must apply it to our lives. We must look at the Word. Literally believe it. And live it out. If we look at the word and we see God is called something sinful, we must avoid it. We must seek to get rid of it in our lives. If God calls something good, we must run to it. If God says we must do something, we must do it. Part of the reason we don't do hard things is because we don't take God's word as his word, as the word of the very word of God. If we would look at it and understand that it is the truth, that it has the answers for life, I think it would change our perspective. You know, as I think about physical fitness and in the fitness space, there's all these gurus out there and everyone has the right answer. Everyone knows how to get you to lose weight. Do this trick, do this thing. They know how to get you to lose weight and get in shape. But literally, if you read people that are actually in the business not to get Instagram followers or not to, to, uh, they're really wanting to help people. Then you boil it down, eat better, eat less. You work out. Some say move more. It's, it's, it's those basic concepts. I mean, that's, that's it. That's the truth. That's the answer. The truth is simple, but it's so hard for many people to live it out because they want what they want the easy solution. They want a pill that they can take that will give them the results that they want. Folks, life doesn't work like that. There's no instant pill that's going to get you to lose weight and get healthy. It's just not going to happen. It's hard work. There's also no pill, no instant thing that's going to help you in your faith. It's hard work. But God is faithful in this task to help you to grow. We have... We have the right answer. We have the plan. We know what it is. It's in the Bible. It's simple, but it can be hard to live out. That's what we're called to do. And I don't want to leave this episode without encouraging us in the area of grace. I know that we are talking a lot about working and living, but this is working and living in the grace of God. This is not where we are seeking to earn our salvation. We're not working for our salvation, but we're working because of our salvation. We're living out a life that is seeking to please the Lord. And we will never do it perfectly. That's why God is so merciful and graceful. That's why his mercies are new every day. So if you looked at your life and you're saying, I've been lazy in my faith. I've, God has been faithful, but I have not been faithful to him. Then you need to repent. You need to turn back to the Lord and ask for renewed faith. He will give you grace in this. He will allow us to grow and and move and, and work in this area. And by his help, by the work of the Spirit, we can be drawn into his presence. We can be able to live for him. So as I was in closing, I just I just want to remind us that it's it's not bad to desire the hard things of life. We should not, especially in the area of faith, desire for things to be easy all the time. But we should seek the things of the Lord first. Remember what the Bible says, seek first his kingdom and all these things will be added unto you. Thank you for listening today. I hope you found it encouraging and challenging. Like I said, these were things that have been on my heart, things that the Lord is teaching me. I am not arrived. I am not there. God has been working these things into my life and my heart. And he's been challenging me in areas. He's been challenging me to steep my life in the word, to kill sin and to avoid temptation so that I can live for his glory. We can do this if we trust him and seek him and follow him. Thank you for listening and we'll see you next time.